I always felt like the overlooked child in my family. Now, after years of distance, my parents expect me to financially support my sister's education. My family is a bit complicated and quite big in its own way. My mom is 71 years old and my dad is 69. They had three kids over the years and I'm one of them. My brother was the oldest. He was six years older than me. He was really something, the kind of older brother everyone would wish they had. Tragically, when he was just 20 years old, he died in a car accident. It was a huge shock to our family and something that really saddened all of us. Then there's my younger sister, who is 10 years younger than me. She's much younger, so we've always had a different kind of relationship. Now, talking about being part of the family, my mom has this way of letting me know, not directly but in a kind of sideways, snarky way, that I wasn't planned. She's mentioned it enough times that it's pretty clear I was a surprise to them. They've never outright said they regretted having me, but when you hear you were an accident and kind of a burden, it's hard not to feel a bit unwanted. What's it like to hear that kind of thing? It makes you question how much you're valued, right? I mean, if your existence is treated like a big inconvenience, it's not easy to just shrug that off. Despite this, I found a lot of support and a role model in my older brother. He wasn't just a brother to me. He was a protector, a hero. He was always there, standing up for me, especially against bullies. And sometimes those bullies were our parents, believe it or not. He also taught me how to stand up for myself, which was invaluable. My brother was not only a protective figure but also quite the charmer and athlete. He was incredibly popular in school, partly because of his good looks and partly because he was genuinely likable. He looked so much like a young Marlon Brando that people would actually tell him that, which is pretty cool if you think about it. He played football in high school as a starting tight end. And he continued to play in college, where he was a notable reserve player during the late 1980s. Everyone knew who he was on and off the field. For me, my brother was the epitome of what I wanted to be. He was everything that our dad wasn't. Where my dad could be petty, weird, and manipulative, my brother shone with his strength, kindness, and integrity. He set an example that was in stark contrast to the negative aspects I saw in my dad, and he inspired me to aim for better, to be better. It's strange to think about how different two people from the same family can be, but my brother and my dad were worlds apart. That difference taught me a lot about who I want to be and the kind of person I strive to become. Growing up, I realized as an adult just how messed up my parents were, both hilarious and tragic in their flaws. As a kid, I often felt like the problem was with me, not understanding the full picture. My brother, who was the golden child in many ways, wasn't perfect in every aspect. He was pretty average in school, pulling in straight C's, and he wasn't musically talented either. Despite these shortcomings, my parents were all in on supporting him because he was handsome, friendly, and great at sports. They really wanted to make him into something special, pouring resources into pursuits like sports, even though he didn't excel in academics or music. For instance, even though he struggled with and disliked piano and violin lessons, our parents bought a piano just for him and paid for all his lessons. When I came into the picture, it was a different story. I always felt like an afterthought to them. It was clear they favored him not because of age differences, but because they simply valued him more. But my brother was different from our parents. He was kind and genuinely cared about me. When I was 10, I showed a natural knack for the piano, the very piano they bought for him. Seeing this, he actually tried to convince our parents to use the money from his music lessons for me instead, since I had the talent he lacked. Unfortunately, they didn't go for it and never funded music lessons for me. Despite their decision, I continued my music journey on my own dime as an adult. Now, I play the piano part-time at a local bar, which I do just for fun. My brother also noticed how our parents didn't make as much of a fuss over my birthdays compared to his. So, he'd use his own money to treat me on my birthday, making sure I felt valued and celebrated. His actions made a big difference to me, showing me that I did matter, even if our parents showed otherwise. When my sister was born while I was in the fifth grade, it felt like my place in the family got even smaller. Suddenly, I wasn't just the middle child. I became the family's go-to babysitter for her. While my parents coddled her and continued to favor my older brother, I felt even more overlooked, like Jan Brady, always in the background. In response, I threw myself into becoming an overachiever, hoping to finally catch some of their attention. But the validation I craved from my parents never came. My parents were also very invested in my brother's future. They went all out for his college education after he secured a partial athletic scholarship, covering all the extra costs. But then tragedy struck. My brother was out jogging one evening when a drunk driver hit him at a crosswalk. His death devastated all of us. I was heartbroken, and so were my parents. But the way they handled their grief made things even harder for me. They took out their anger and sadness on me, constantly hinting that I could never fill my brother's shoes. The message was clear. I was seen as less than my brother. They would often imply that if it had to be one of us who died, they wished it had been me instead of him. These aren't just the bitter reflections of an adult looking back. This is how things were. It's taken years of therapy for me to look back on these events calmly and rationally, to understand that the way my parents treated me was rooted in their own issues, not in my worth as a person. 
Growing up as a teenager, I was a bit overweight and shorter than many of my peers, which compounded the sense of not fitting in, especially within my own family. It was tough to feel confident about myself when my physical appearance was a constant source of comparison to my brother, who was notably tall and athletic. My dad often pointed out these differences in a way that wasn't just observational, but painfully dismissive. He'd say things like, your brother was 6 feet 3 inches when he was your age, as if to underline that I somehow fell short, literally and figuratively. It was as though he expected me to magically stretch myself to match the blueprint of a son he preferred. I remember jokingly thinking about telling my legs to grow because, according to my dad, I must have chosen the wrong genes, genes that, ironically, came from him. When the time came for me to consider college, the disparity in how my parents supported me versus my brother became starkly evident. My academic achievements, which were objectively impressive, seemed to fade into the background for them. Throughout high school, I maintained perfect marks and racked up numerous awards in science and engineering, fields I was genuinely passionate about. Yet, despite these accolades, my parents offered no financial support or even words of encouragement when it came to my higher education. They didn't offer to help with tuition or living expenses, nor did they show up to celebrate my achievements at award ceremonies. The only school event they attended was my graduation, and even that felt as if they were fulfilling an obligation rather than celebrating an achievement. Their interactions with me were often tinged with a passive aggressiveness that could cut deep. After years of striving and excelling academically, their only remark about my high school graduation was to point out that I was the salutatorian, not the valedictorian. This comment felt like a sharp jab, diminishing all my hard work and dedication. It was incredibly frustrating to constantly feel that no matter how well I did, it was never quite good enough for them. Despite this lack of support, I pursued my education relentlessly. In college, I continued to achieve top grades, a testament to my resilience and determination. My academic success was a source of personal pride and proof that I could thrive even without their financial backing or moral support. This journey through academia was mine alone, shaped by my efforts and achievements, and it taught me a valuable lesson about self-reliance and the importance of believing in oneself despite external validation or the lack thereof. By the time I reached the end of high school, it was painfully clear that my presence wasn't exactly cherished by my parents. Despite this, I had excelled academically and was awarded several full-ride scholarships, both within and outside my home state. When I expressed a desire to accept a scholarship that would take me across the country, my parents' response was dishearteningly indifferent. There were no pleas for me to stay nearby, no expressions of missing me, just a simple shrug. So, feeling unvalued and seeking change, I decided to move away and start fresh in a place I nicknamed Effort and Blue Town. While attending college, I worked part-time at a Rite Aid drugstore to supplement my scholarships, majoring in aerospace engineering and minoring in physics. Despite the physical and emotional distance, I tried to maintain some connection by visiting my parents during holidays. However, these visits only reinforced the feeling that I was as inconsequential to them as ever. When I started graduate school on yet another full scholarship, I reached a turning point. I decided it was time to really cut ties, so I stopped calling them. The lack of effort from their side was telling. They didn't reach out to me either. Years have passed since then, and I've built a successful career in aerospace, a field I am passionate about. I earn a substantial salary, own my home, two luxury vehicles, an RV, and a motorcycle. Beyond material success, my personal life has been fulfilling and stable. I've been happily married for nearly 20 years to a wonderful woman who fell in love with me long before I had achieved any financial success. She's 40 now, has her own thriving career in literature, and has been a partner who truly values and supports me. Our life together stands in stark contrast to the indifference I experienced from my parents. It's ironic that only in recent times they've started to reach out again, perhaps prompted by word of my successes. But the foundation of our relationship, or the lack thereof, was set long ago, defined by their earlier disinterest and lack of support. My journey has taught me about the importance of self-reliance, resilience, and the real value of relationships based on mutual respect and genuine affection. With my own family now, a five-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter, I have a very clear blueprint of what not to do as a parent, thanks to my own upbringing. My experiences have deeply influenced my parenting style, and I'm committed to ensuring my children always feel valued and loved. Meanwhile, my sister's life took a different path. She married young at 19 to someone I had a gut feeling wasn't right for her, a guy who seemed like a loser and a user. True to form, my parents didn't hesitate to splash out on a lavish wedding for her. At that time, although I wasn't yet at the peak of my financial success, I was already doing well. I attended the wedding, and the familiar coldness from my family was as palpable as ever. Nobody acknowledged how much I had grown, not just in stature, I had a growth spurt at 20 and was now over 6 feet tall and in great shape, but also in life. Despite the chilly reception, I didn't hold back in showing my support for my sister. I gave her a $5,000 wedding gift. I also played the piano at her wedding, something she requested after a family friend mentioned my private lessons. My performance was well received, and many guests were enthusiastic, offering backslaps and compliments, everyone, that is, except for my parents. 
Sadly, my sister's marriage didn't last. She divorced her husband two years ago after coming to the harsh realization that he was indeed the loser and user I had suspected. Now, she's left dealing with the aftermath, including the struggle to secure child support for her six-year-old daughter from her ex-husband, who claims he has no money. This contrast in paths between my sister and me has only highlighted the disparities in how we were treated growing up. It has reinforced my commitment to ensuring my children never feel the neglect I did. Instead, they'll grow up knowing they are supported and cherished, no matter what. It's definitely a complicated time for my family. My sister, after not finding work with her degree in modern art, a degree our dad paid for, has moved back in with our parents. She's considering going back to school, believing she needs another degree or additional skills to land a well-paying job. Just as she's trying to figure out her next steps, my parents have suddenly remembered my phone number. They haven't explicitly said so, but it seems they've blown through their savings on indulging her and their own penchant for lavish vacations. Now, they seem to think it's my duty as the financially successful big brother to step in and foot the bill. My mom's reasoning? It would be classy of me to offer to pay for my sister's education because she really needs the help. And apparently, I wasn't around much when she was younger, since I moved out early. And to add to the pressure, she's also lamenting that now that she and dad are getting older, it's such a shame I don't visit more. They can't seem to understand why I'm arrogant and don't see them often, which is total gaslighting. Dad has been notably quiet through all of this. I can't help but feel his silence means he knows the real score. They know how they've treated me, and what they're asking now might not be fair. Figuring out how to respond to this is tough. I need to think about whether helping out could genuinely aid my sister and possibly mend our relationship, or if it would just further enable my parents' behavior. It's also crucial for me to consider what boundaries I need to maintain for my own mental well-being amidst their expectations and manipulations. Hearing from my dad that my brother was ashamed of me just after losing him was a brutal blow. It contradicted everything my brother had personally assured me of shortly before his passing. That he loved me, that he'd always be there for me, and that no one could hurt me under his watch. Despite all the years and the distance I've put between us, my brother's influence remains a guiding force in my life. His encouragement and love inspire me to strive and succeed, standing in stark contrast to the negativity from my dad, who continues to disappoint with his hurtful comments and behavior. Now with my parents pressing me to financially support my sister's further education, I'm torn. Although my sister and I never had a particularly bad relationship, she has adopted some of our parents' less admirable traits, like narcissism, which makes the decision to help financially even more complicated. I'm in a strong financial position, capable of helping out, but part of me resists rewarding how they've all treated me over the years. Moreover, with my own kids nearing college age, I have to consider their futures and the possibility of unforeseen financial challenges, like the risk of job loss, which could change everything. Above all, I worry about my niece. She's about the same age as my children, and I can't stand the thought of her suffering due to lack of support. It's a delicate balance, trying to ensure she doesn't get caught in the fallout from the strained family relations while also protecting my own family's future and well-being. Deciding whether to offer financial help is more than just a financial decision. It's a moral and emotional one, too. It's about setting boundaries while still caring for innocent family members caught in the middle. It's about deciding what's ultimately best for the long-term health and happiness of both my immediate family and myself. Under what terms should I offer money? Should I offer any at all? If not, how can I help in other ways? Now for the comments before the update. It's a shame for your sister and her daughter, but their situation is a result of your sister's bad life choices. It's not your job to bail them out of these problems. You have to set up a boundary here because it won't stop with this money, I suspect. I imagine that it will be your sister's college. Then she needs money for her own home. Then your parents will start to suffer as they get older, and they'll need something. And of course, you are a terrible son if you refuse to pay for it, and so on and so on. You have two children of your own to look after. And while you've built an enviable life for yourself, you are not exactly a millionaire. Take care of your own wife and children first. Update. After weeks of mulling it over, I finally settled on a plan that felt right. Instead of directly funding another degree for my sister, I decided to focus on supporting my niece. This approach would provide tangible help without continuing the cycle of dependency that I'd seen in my parents and sister. I called a family meeting to lay out my decision. I explained that while I wasn't comfortable subsidizing my sister's further education, I was open to setting up a college fund for my niece. I wanted to invest in the future generation, ensuring they have opportunities without direct strings attached. To my surprise, my parents reacted with a mixture of disappointment and understanding. They had hoped for immediate financial relief, but the idea of supporting my niece seemed to resonate with them on some level. My sister, however, was visibly frustrated, having expected more direct support for herself. I set up a savings account that would grow over the years, ensuring that when my niece was ready, she would have a substantial fund to draw from for her education. I also offered to mentor her, hoping to provide the guidance and support that might have been missing from my own upbringing. The reactions from my family were mixed. My parents, realizing that this was the most support they could expect from me, tentatively agreed to my terms. 
My sister, feeling slighted but seeing no other option, reluctantly accepted the arrangement. Over time, I began building a relationship with my niece, involving her in discussions about her interests and potential career paths, which turned out to be a fulfilling experience for both of us. As I navigated this new family dynamic, I found that setting clear boundaries had not only helped manage my family's expectations, but had also given me a sense of peace. I realized that while I couldn't change the past or completely heal the fractures within my family, I could impact the future in a positive way. With these changes, I felt a cautious optimism about the future. I had managed to provide support in a way that aligned with my values, and while the relationship with my parents and sister remained complicated, I had created a meaningful bond with my niece. This experience reinforced my commitment to being a different kind of parent and mentor, one who supports and uplifts without fostering dependency. Moving forward, I focused on nurturing the positive relationships in my life, especially with my own children and wife, and I found that this decision reinforced my role as a provider who was thoughtful about the impact of his support. I remained open to the possibility of mending relationships with my sister and parents, but I maintained the boundaries that kept my own family's well-being at the forefront. Last story. So, I'm a 29-year-old woman, and a little while ago, I decided to move to a new state because my brother, who is five years older than me, offered me a place to stay. He thought it would be great if I lived with him and his wife until I could find a place of my own. When I moved in, they didn't set up any strict rules for me, which sounded pretty cool at first. I also started paying them some rent, so I felt like I was contributing to the household. However, things began to get a bit weird and uncomfortable not long after I arrived. Every single Sunday, my brother and his wife would have this formal sit-down with me. They wanted to talk about what I was doing to improve myself and what kinds of jobs I was looking for. It kind of felt like I was having a weekly review at a job, which was a lot of pressure. Then, there was this one time, just a week after I moved in, that really made me feel invaded. They came right into my room, plopped down on the floor, and demanded to go through my emails. They wanted to see exactly what jobs I was applying for, which made me super uncomfortable. It's like they didn't trust me to handle my own job search. As if that wasn't enough, they started commenting on my lifestyle too. They noticed that I drink a lot of energy drinks and that my eating habits aren't the healthiest. Then, they began making these remarks about how I needed to exercise more, which felt really judgmental. There were also times when they'd hold on to things I said in passing and then later use them against me. For instance, I once mentioned I liked bike riding. Well, they turned this into a big deal, getting upset that I hadn't gone out and bought a bike yet. It was as if they expected me to live up to everything I casually mentioned. And then, there was the job at the bank that I was really excited about. I applied and was hoping to hear back, but the hiring process was dragging on. This job was important to me, but waiting to hear back was stressful, especially with everything else going on at home. Living with them started to feel like I was under a microscope all the time, being watched and judged, which was not what I expected when I first moved in. It was supposed to be a temporary and supportive arrangement, but it's turned into something that makes me feel on edge a lot. After I moved in with my brother and his wife, I managed to find a job at a local steakhouse. The job was pretty demanding with long hours, often requiring me to work double shifts. This meant I usually didn't get home until late at night, sometimes as late as 1.30 in the morning. Despite the grueling schedule, I wasn't really into drinking much. However, after such exhausting shifts, I'd have a beer once or twice a week just to unwind a bit. I never even finished a whole beer. It was just something to help me relax after a tough day. My brother and his wife, however, took issue with this too. They discovered that I occasionally had a beer by snooping through my room. They said they were looking for a missing glass, but while searching, they found out about my postwork beers. Their reaction was intense. They called for what they described as an intervention. They sat me down and expressed their concerns, claiming they thought I had a drinking problem. I didn't agree with them at all. I knew I wasn't drinking in a way that was harmful. The conversation didn't stop at the beer. It turned into a full-blown critique session about various aspects of my life they disapproved of. They even recorded our talk without telling me, and later, they sent the recording to other family members. This felt like a huge invasion of my privacy and trust. Things escalated when another brother of mine and his wife came to town for a wedding. The family used this as an opportunity to sit me down again, and everyone piled on with more criticism. It was really overwhelming and hurtful to be attacked like that by my own family. Despite all this, I tried to get past it and move on, but it was definitely a lot to handle. Things calmed down for a bit after all that family drama. I finished training for a new banking job, which is a work-from-home position, so I've been staying in a lot because of the workload. This job pays better, which is great because my boyfriend and I were already planning to move in together by the end of the year. He lives an hour away, and because I've been so busy, I hadn't seen him for a couple of weeks. Yesterday was a big day for me. It was not only Thanksgiving, but also my birthday. My boyfriend came over to celebrate with me. He picked me up from my place, and we went out to grab some food, and just enjoy the day together. We decided to have a low-key celebration, just the two of us, watching videos on my phone while eating ice cream. We were having such a good time that I didn't notice my phone battery was running low until it died. 
My phone charger has been on the fritz, so we made a quick stop at the store to pick up a new one before heading back to my house. Once we got back, I plugged in my phone to let it charge up. We arrived at my house around 11.30 pm. After a really nice day together, we weren't quite ready to end the night, so we stayed outside in the car, talking for a bit longer. At midnight, I decided it was time to head inside. My house has one of those electronic doorknobs that you open with a pin code. Normally, I walk to the door by myself, but this time my boyfriend came with me because he was carrying the cake he had gotten for my birthday. It was a simple but sweet end to a special day. When we got to my house, I tried to unlock the door using the electronic keypad, but my code wouldn't work. I was really confused and couldn't figure out what was wrong, so I turned on my recently charged phone to see if there was any explanation. That's when I found a bunch of texts from my brother's wife. She had texted to say that if I got home after midnight, I'd be locked out. This was a complete surprise to me because we had never talked about having a curfew, and there were no rules about needing to be home by a certain time. In fact, when I was working at the restaurant, I came home later than midnight all the time. With no way to get into the house, my boyfriend and I were stuck figuring out what to do next. We ended up having to find a hotel to stay in, but since it was Thanksgiving, almost every place was fully booked. We finally found a room, but it cost us $1.300 and we didn't get settled until around 3 am. The original plan was for my boyfriend to go back to his place after dropping me off and then return the next day to take me to my grandma's for a Thanksgiving celebration. But after the hotel hassle, I had nothing with me. No change of clothes, no toothbrush, not even anything to remove my makeup with. The next day, I was so upset and stressed that I ended up having a panic attack and spent the entire day crying in my boyfriend's car. We both looked a mess and felt terrible, so we didn't go to my grandma's for Thanksgiving after all. This whole situation made me really upset. While I understand that my brother and his wife might not like it when I come home late, it would have been much better if they had talked to me about their feelings and expectations. Locking me out without any prior discussion didn't seem fair or reasonable. So it was supposed to be a really special day for me. It was Thanksgiving and also my birthday. I had plans to see my grandma and the rest of my family, which I was really looking forward to. But something really unexpected and upsetting happened that totally changed everything. My brother and his wife decided to lock me out of the house and they only gave me less than an hour's notice. The worst part? I didn't even see their warning because my phone had died, so I couldn't read the message they sent. It felt really cruel that they did this, especially on such an important day. It ruined all my plans because I couldn't get into my house to get ready to go see my family. I'm sitting here wondering if I did something really bad without realizing it, or if it's normal not to expect to be locked out like this. The reaction from them seemed really extreme to me, but I'm confused because my brother's wife hasn't replied to any messages I sent her. I've been so stressed that I've just been crying all day. I'm also scared to go back home now. I worry that I might still be locked out, or even if I can get in, that they might just start lecturing or arguing with me again. I keep thinking about what could have happened if my boyfriend hadn't been there with me at the door. What if he had left already and my phone was almost out of battery? I might have had to sleep in my car. When we were standing at the door, I was shivering because I was only wearing light clothes and it was cold outside. Right now, I haven't gone back home yet because I'm really scared and feeling sick from all the anxiety. I'm not sure how to handle this situation or what I should do next. Any advice would be really helpful. Now for the comments before the update. You need to get out of there fast. This is toxic as hell. They're controlling your life and manipulating you relentlessly and the rest of your family isn't much better. Move out by yourself in a few months. The anxiety will subside and you'll realize you don't have to worry about people going through your stuff, etc. That's when you can have your partner move in and be sure you're not continuing weird toxic behaviors without realizing out-of-condition terror.